Hi, I'm Bill Paglia for the Society for the Quantitative Analyses of Behavior. While a traditional analysis simply looks at the effect of an independent variable on a dependent variable, or several isolated independent variables on a dependent variable, a quantitative analysis is the specification of the function that relates the behavior of an individual organism to all the values that the independent variable could take. In order to make it easier for researchers to implement this more powerful analytical strategy, Squab has invited our most preeminent scholars to give tutorials at the annual conference on the analysis of behavior. These tutorials provide the foundation for applying a quantitative analysis across a wide range of behavioral phenomena. We hope that this videotape series will enable you to more easily use quantitative procedures to serve your research purposes and to help you get to know the people who have created modern behavior analysis. In order to provide you with access to these tutorials and in order for you to meet these scholars, we've informally videotaped their lectures. We would like to provide you with high-end studio production with exotic location shots and post-production special effects and all the rest, but we can't. In the meantime, this is something positive that we can do. I'm John Malone, a professor at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And I'm here to describe the essentials of radical behaviorism and to show it's a current version of a view that's thousands of years old. I believe that anyone given enough education and experience, anyone who knows what's what, would be a radical behaviorist. But it's hard to discern what's what since misinterpretations are so common. Usually radical behaviorism is portrayed as a repulsive version of ever-present pop cognitive views the mechanical model that won't let us study the mind, and so on. This couldn't be further from the truth. This misinterpretation will continue since radical behaviorism is a departure from ordinary psychology, and so is bound to be misconstrued. A radical behaviorism is not cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychology can actually defi be defined more charitably, but in many ways it's a synonym for conventional, ordinary, generic, vanilla, pop psychology. It places the causes of our actions inside us as mediators, just as common sense does. And it's been around forever, just like astrology. Behaviorism is a clear alternative to cognitive psychology, but only if it's the radical behaviorism of B.F. Skinner or one of its variants, actually one of its improved variants. Beware of false behaviorisms. Those behaviorisms constitute what Skinner in 1945 called methodological behaviorism, and they're actually cognitive theories. Methodological behaviorism is the awful behaviorism that you encounter in textbooks and in the popular press. It's the behaviorism that treats us as machines with no minds. It's bad behaviorism. Skinner always criticized it, and rightly so. Cognitive psychology and methodological behaviorism represent traditional psychology which is consistent with the folk psychology we grew up with. But it's not good psychology. Traditional psychology is bad, very bad. Radical behaviorism deals more effectively with the topics usually considered cognitive, and it provides solutions to problems that have been deemed insoluble. And radical behaviorism has been around for a long time. It's not a 20th century creation. When you see behaviorism criticized, once again, it's almost always methodological behaviorism that's the target, whatever the critic calls it. Yet radical behavioral views are spreading to areas such as legal theory, advertising, social psychology, the psychology of language and awareness, and even to some so-called cognitive areas. But few realize this has happened, and that's the topic for another video. Philip Heinlein suggested that much of the misunderstanding of radical behaviorism was B.F. Skinner's own doing. In seeking to popularize his views, Skinner inevitably dumbed them down. 
presented them in a simplified way that invited misunderstanding. Skinner's operant conditioning theory and its applications presented in popular books and in the press have made him familiar to the general public. But the public conception is a very limited one. Not surprisingly, in the popular Skinner seems to be a composite of newspaper items that describe aspects of very different people. So what is radical behaviorism? Radical behaviorism is the high road. The key aspects of radical behaviorism weren't original with Skinner. In fact, the basic tenets have been promoted for over 2,000 years. In one line of thought concerning the nature of mind, and this might be called the high road. The chief characteristic of this position is its metaphysical and epistemological monism. Uh, from now on, I'll refer to that as monism. Metaphysical monism is the view that nature is of one kind. There's no mind or spirit that is essentially different from the material of our bodies or of the rest of the universe. Epistemology is a study of the origin and nature of knowledge. What can we know and how do we know it? Epistemological monism holds that there is no real distinction between subject and object, or the knower and the known. Simply put, epistemological monism does, believes that we know things around us not because of copies, but by direct contact with them. So radical behaviorism is monistic both, both, <clears throat> as far as the nature of underlying reality. It is one thing, not matter, not mind, but one thing. And knowledge does not occur because we make copies of things. Radical behaviorism continues the historical traditions of these monisms. And like most other mo monisms, uh, it views psychology as a study of activity, not of static things, be they representations, habits, or other things. I list here now the defining characteristics of radical behaviorism. And a very good job of this has already been done by Sam Legland in a collection of readings uh, edited by Getze and Hayes, or Hayes and Getze, whichever, in 1997. And he agrees pretty much with this listing, but maybe not entirely. Number one, radical behaviorism involves no dualisms. There's no separation of mind and body. There's no distinction between knower and known. The mind-body distinction is a bad one. Number two, radical behaviorism deals with dynamics and not with statics. The subject matter of psychology is best viewed as activity or behavior. This view has been held by some thinkers for millennia, but it always has been the minority opinion. Number three, radical behaviorism accepts no mediators. Mediation, mediationism is the according of causal status to inferred events. It's what Skinner criticized as cognitive psychology. Such things as memories, images, Expect expectancies, sensations, percepts, cognitions, habits, representations, and so on are only a few of the countless mediators that have been proposed to underlie our observable activity. No one has a thought, but we think. No one sees images, but we see things. No one has sensations, but we do sense. Number four, private experience is included. However, personal experience does not occur inside us or outside us. It merely comprises activity that may not be visible to others. As Skinner wrote, the skin isn't an important boundary, and private activity is the same in kind as public activity. We may often predict and influence the private activity of others just as we influence their and our public activity. Number five, much that we call mental phenomena is actually behavior occurring over time. The private-public distinction is acceptable and refers to real things. But the mental-physical or mind-body distinction is a false one, since mind is wholly fictional. Howard Rackland followed Aristotle in making a convincing case for the equivalence of mental and observable activity extended in time. I'll explain this shortly. And number six, traditional operant conditioning terms even though they're closely connected with B.F. Skinner, have no special status and no special connection to radical behaviorism. The few terms introduced by Skinner in 1938 in The Behavior of Organisms, and those added since, are not sacred. In fact, the most basic terms, such as stimulus, response, and reinforcer, were used by other theorists with very different meaning. 
from that of radical behaviorists. When such terms are used, they're always functionally defined and never assumed in advance. And they could well be disposed with. Now, getting to similar views through history, I've said that radical behaviorism, as I've defined it, represents a tradition with a very long history. But this tradition has always been overshadowed by the low road. If it's the high road, there has to be a low road. Excuse me. The low road is the easy dualism of mind and body that conforms to standard normal religion and to uncritical common sense. The low road is clearly represented in the teachings of Pythagoras during the 6th century BC, which were adopted by Plato 200 years later, as well as by countless others through history. This view has always been dominant. Pythagoras viewed mind and body as utterly different. The body is an impure vessel for the mind or soul, which acts as an ancient version of Casper the ghost. After death, souls are recycled and animate a new body, much as Shirley MacLaine would have it. Sensory knowledge depends on copies of external things that pass through us. So our senses are unreliable, and we must pierce the veil of appearances to find real truth, which is spelled with a capital T. The soul or mind, Casper the ghost, does this. When we explain our actions in that way, in terms of a separate mind or a ghost, we rely on very bad psychology, since our explanations are based on ghosts and ghosts don't exist. Now the high road begins with the Milesians of the 6th century BC. This is something you've not heard before. It may seem odd to refer back to Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes as pro-radical behaviorists, but they represented a material monism that stood in contrast to the Pythagorean dualism that proved far more popular. The natural scientists of Miletus opposed mind-body dualism and believed that we're truly parts of nature. There's no special soul substance that animates us. As part of nature, we're as understandable as is the rest of nature. If the weather and movements of the planets are predictable to some extent, then our behavior and our thoughts are predictable to some extent. The Milesians also believed that constant change or activity was the rule, and that we should seek out regularities in this apparent chaos. Now, as one caveat, if we're part of nature and what we call mind is also part of, of the rest of the universe, then another way of looking at it is to say that the universe itself is animate, is animated. This is a panpsychism. I see nothing wrong with panpsychism. But needless to say, the metaphysical dualism of Pythagoras prevailed and was passed on through many successors, including Plato, Augustine, and Descartes, and it's dominant today. The high road continues with Protagoras of the 5th century BC. Protagoras of Abdera in Macedonia could be called the William James of ancient times, possibly the Charles Peirce of ancient times. He proposed that there is no absolute truth, that man is the measure of all things, and that epistemology does not involve the taking in of copies. Sensation is a relation between the sense organ and the object sensed, each dependent on the other. The soul is the sum of its objects, and no more. This is epistemological monism. There's no distinction between the knower and the known. A little known aspect of Protagoras' philosophy Protagoras was a sophist, by the way, is the pragmatism he promoted. While there's no absolute truth, there's a ranking of truths according to the degree to which they promote health and well-being. You could say the degree to which they're useful. His contemporary, Democritus, was also from Ad Abdera and promoted the representational theory of atomism, an epistemological dualism that relies on the taking in of copies as the basis of knowledge. That theory, epistemological dualism, has survived the millennia and remains dominant today. The low road of mind-body dualism, the ghost in the machine, has remained essentially unchanged since ancient times. It was passed on through Plato, Augustine, Descartes, as well as many others. Who else has taken the high road? Well, the most conspicuous ancient figure on the high road is Aristotle, the author of De Anima and the Nicomachean Ethics, this, both of these written in the 4th century BC.
Aristotle was an epistemological and almost surely metaphysical monist who's often been cast as a, the major impediment to the progress of Western science. Bertrand Russell, for example, criticizes Aristotle strongly for impeding Western science in its advance. And so he was. But the Western science that he impeded was disastrous for psychology. It was the dualistic, mechanical science of Galileo, Descartes, and Newton, which was great for physics, horrible for psychology. They all relegated sensory experience to the scrap heap of unknowable, subjective mental states. Green, thought, and sadness were meaningless to Galileo. Psychology could never be science in his eyes. He was satisfied with Casper the Ghost. Aristotle, as a psychologist, followed Protagoras as an epistemological monist. He opposed the copy theory and promoted dynamics or functioning as basic. Mind is a mode of functioning of a body, a capacity of a set of organs. Mind does not exist unless it acts for Aristotle. By the same token, sensing, imagining, and remembering are all activities. But there is always an object of sensation, thought, and so on. There is no such thing as seeing without seeing something. The knower and the known are fused and inseparable. Remember that. This is also the opinion of Protagoras a century earlier. It's a radical empiricism that characterized others through history who took the high road. Jean Piaget, the famed child psychologist who died in 1980, was not a radical behaviorist. But he did endorse the monism that was assumed by Aristotle and that characterizes radical behaviorism. He wrote this in an authoritative chapter published three years after his death. Hence, the limit between subject and objects is in no way determined beforehand. And what is more important, it isn't stable. Indeed, in every action, the subject and the objects are fused. Got that? The subjects and objects are fused. Knowledge at its origin neither arises from objects nor from the subject, but from interactions, at first inextricable between the subject and those objects. Even these primitive interactions are so close-knit and inextricable that, as James Mark Baldwin noted, the mental attitudes of the infant are probably adualistical, meaning monistic, meaning there's no distinction between subject and object. And James Mark Baldwin, of course, was the originator of the theory called genetic epistemology, who proposed a set of cognitive stages, studies his own children, emphasized accommodation, assimilation, and so on, uh, which, uh, points which were all adopted by Piaget and usually associated with him. Aristotle's soul, or anima, is similarly inseparable from the body and can't exist without the body. Aristotle compared the soul-body relation with the straightness of a line. Straightness corresponds to the soul and has no existence without a line or other surface to be configured as straight. The soul is likewise non-existent without the body. This is metaphysical monism and it provided difficulties for Thomas Aquinas who based his Catholic philosophy on Aristotle. Aristotle also wrote the Nicomachean Ethics, a brilliant treatise that led Howard Rackland to argue in 1994 that Aristotle understood the conception of history of reinforcement better than did Skinner. The Nicomachean Ethics begins with the assumption that happiness does not depend on hedonism. The gaining of pleasure and avoidance of pain. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even a child can feel pleasure, while happiness requires that a pattern of life be established. Happiness isn't an emotion or a momentary state of mind. It exists only in patterns of activity. Aristotle wrote that one swallow does not make a spring, and one act does not define happiness, courage, honesty, love, pain, contentment. These all refer to temporally extended, extended patterns of activity. In 1987, Howard Racklin argued that Aristotle's interpretation is identical to a proper radical behavioral treatment of mental. How do we treat mental? Is it inside as Casper the Ghost or as Howard Racklin put it, overt behavior does not just reveal the mind. It is the mind. Each mental term stands for a pattern of overt behavior. 
This may include such mental terms as sensation, pain, love, hunger, and fear, as well as more complex mental states such as belief and intelligence that are sometimes said to be complex mental states and sometimes intentional acts. Racklin noted that ordinary language promotes the plausibility of mediational mentalist cognitive theories, which therefore seem more natural. It seems unnatural to think of a mental event as something extended in time, unless you think of love as a set of activities, things that people do over time, that people say and think over time, so that if someone's asleep, love is still exists. It's not individual discrete acts. Uh, as, as Racklin put it, with regard to plausibility, Behaviorism looks worse than any of the other theories. It seems implausible that a mental event such as a hope could originate outside us and that our behavior, rather than being only a sign or indication of what we hope, is itself the hope. Mentalism, with its vague and shaky reliance on introspection, accurately mirrors our current vague and shaky understanding of mental events. This is what lends mentalism its plausibility. The problem is that mentalism imperializes its own vague and shaky understanding. It provides no path to a more coherent model of the mind. Racklin treats the soul as a temporally extended, overt, observable pattern of behavior. That's close to Aristotle's view during the fourth century BC. Now after Aristotle, luckily his writings were preserved and taken over by the Arabs, and I say thank goodness for the Arabs. And his, the, his psychology was first passed on through the Islamic scholars Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushdi, or Avicenna and Averroes, as they were called by Christian scholars. Thomas Aquinas presented Aristotle's philosophy during the 13th century in his Summa Theologica. In 1897, Aquinas' adaptation of Aristotle became the official doctrine of the Catholic Church, leading to the surprising conclusion that the Catholic Church's philosophy is actually radical behaviorism, but that's the case. Averroes was particularly good, a sincerely religious um, a Muslim, uh, who held that only an Aristotelian can understand the true meaning of revealed law. This Aristotelian philosopher is thus superior to the Muslim theologian who is, who is platonic by comparison, and the theologian is himself surely superior to the masses to whom truth must not be revealed but who must mo accept the plain surface meaning of the scriptures. The sort of monism that uh, Aristotle spoke of was appreciated by Islamic scholars, thank goodness, and thus was preserved and passed on to us. Now, continuing the high road, uh, we now have a gap of approximately 700 years, and we come to David Hume, probably the smartest man who ever lived, whose final words were, adieu, etc. And... Uh, who, whose proposals are very similar to those of B.F. Skinner's, except B.F. Skinner's were made in 1953, 200 years later. And in 53, Skinner proposed that we're many selves, since a self is a set of behaviors organized around common situations. Thus, we have a self at home, a self at work, and so on. I was not myself, I was beside myself, and what, and what all. John B. Watson held the same view in the early 20th century. There's no real or authentic self. This view can be traced back to at least the 18th century when it was proposed by the Scottish genius David Hume who questioned the existence of a unitary self that's born, lives, and dies, or is reborn. When we examine the idea of self, we find that it's a complex idea, partly of our own making. Immanuel Kant, Hume's powerful critic, agreed. We don't sense a self. Now, if you think, what is, what is the, my self? When I really get to it and try to, try to conceive it, uh, Hume wrote, nor do we have any idea of self after the manner it's here explained. For what, from what impression could this idea be derived? What sensation corresponds to the idea of self? The question is impossible to answer without a manifest contradiction and absurdity. And yet, tis a question which must necessarily be answered if we would have the idea of self passed for clear and intelligible. Now, what do we find when we look for the self? Hume found, for my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold. And were all my perceptions removed by death, and could I neither think nor feel, nor see nor love, nor hate after the dissolution of my body, 
I have no sensations. My body is dissolved. I should be entirely annihilated. Nor do I conceive what is farther requisite to make me a perfect non-entity. Hume seems correct, and this being the case, we might well wonder from where we do get the absurd notion that we're a self, independent of percepts of sight and sound, and touch and smell and emotion. Hume tells us that this is the same process that leads us to attribute identities to the object of sense. And as he says, we have a distinct idea of an object that remains invariable and uninterrupted through a supposed variation of time. And this idea we call that of identity or sameness. We also have a distinct idea of several different objects existing in succession and connected together by a close relation. And this, to an accurate view, accords this perfect notion of diversity, as if there were no manner of relation among the objects. It's easy to keep separate these two ideas, the same thing going through time, or a succession of things going through instants of time, one would think. But in fact, we confuse them all the time. Because we can't distinguish a single persisting object from a series of different but related objects. We call them the same. Though we have an odd feeling, they're not the same. As Hume put it, in order to justify to ourselves this absurdity, we often feign some new and unintelligible principle that connects the objects together and prevents their interruption and variation. Thus, we feign the continued existence of the perceptions of our senses to remove the interruption and run into the notion of a soul and a self and substance to disguise the variation. Notice this is another instance of interpreting a mental entity, the feeling of self, as a pattern of activity occurring over time, as Aristotle and Racklin would have it. Others adopted this view of the self, including the Scottish physician and philosopher Thomas Brown, who presented it in this way around 1800. He asked us to consider the great changes that may occur in one's personality as the years pass. Does the person or self remain the same? And as he put it, suppose you, you've been away from your country for decades, and you return to see your father. This is the person who bounced you on his knee. This is the person who taught you right from wrong. This is the smartest, strongest, best looking, best person who ever lived. And you return to find him, you return to find him sunk perhaps in the imbecility of idiotism. That's a wonderful expression. Unable to recognize us. Ignorant alike of the past and future, living only in the sensibility of animal gratification. Uh, who shares no memories with you, doesn't recognize you. When we observe all this, do we use only a metaphor of little meaning when we say that he's become a different person and his mind and character are changed? In what way does the identity consist? How is it the same person at all? It's a completely different person. The father's gone. The assumed identity of the self from day to day and birth to death finds a parallel in the life of a pair of socks. And as Brown went on, Sir John Cutler had a pair of black worsted stockings, which is made darn so often with silk that they became at last a pair of silk stockings. And of course, Cutler would ask, where are my worsted stockings? Even though they're entirely made of silk. They've changed entirely, but they remain like my grandfather's knife that's got its fifth blade and its twelfth handle and so on. Still my grandfather's knife. And Hume also realized that much of what we call free will seems pretty orderly to others. And he said, we may imagine we feel a liberty within ourselves, but a spectator can commonly infer our actions from our motives and character, what they know of us. Now, there's much more to Hume, of course. I'm just picking high spots. Uh, I continue the high road with John Stuart Mill, another probably greatest mind who ever lived. And Mill faced the same problem that Skinner faced, this being in the mid-19th century, showing that pop cognitive psychology was not the only nor the best way to deal with psychology. He chose Sir William Hamilton as his target, much as Skinner chose Noam Chomsky and the rest of cognitive psychology as his. Hamilton was an advocate of intuitionism, the doctrine that we come into the world with wonderful innate functions, all prepared to recognize truth when we experience it. A comparable modern example of such intuitionism is Noam Chomsky, who argued for the innate knowledge of language, requiring us to come with a language acquisition device. This view really irritated John Stuart Mill, who smashed Hamilton's theory to powder and proposed his own theory of belief in its place. Without going into detail, I point out this theory is precisely that of B.F. Skinner, or vice versa, as presented in About Behaviorism, for example. Skinner viewed perception as activity, such as seeing or hearing, that was shaped by one's past. We're apt to see what's customary 
what we've seen in the past under similar circumstances. He wrote that we don't respond to stimuli, we respond to our histories. This is precisely Mill's theory of belief, which holds that we respond to a little bit of what is present and make a heap of inferences about what's there. A mountain seen in clear air appears closer than it is, since clear things have in the past been close. I think that Mill and Skinner would agree that the loved one that we see at a seance is actually there. That is, we do see the loved one in exactly the same way that we saw the loved one early in our life. That is, as a little bit of sensation and a mass of inferences based on our history with that person. Extremists have carried this doctrine to absurd lengths, postmodernists, crazies, during the last decades of the 20th century. But basically, it's sound. And it's radically behavioral. Next, we come to Alexander Bain on the high road. And Alexander Bain was a famous associationist. We're commonly told that the 19th century associationists believed that the mind was like a switchboard, filled with connections that were essentially passive. And that makes Alexander Bain surprising to those who actually read his books, which were immensely popular during the late 1880s, late 1800s. Bain was not a radical behaviorist, to be sure, but he promoted some ideas that should seem familiar to radical behaviorists. First, Bain viewed activity as basic. In The Senses and the Intellect, published in 1855, Bain stressed the fact that organisms are typically active rather than passive. This is evidenced in muscular tonus, the continued activity of the circulatory system and other systems, and the fact that we awaken from sleep and spontaneously feel energetic. The movement of the infant when warm and fed shows that we're active beings, independent of basic needs and things. This emphasis on activity is a hallmark of radical behaviorism, of course. Bain also argued that thought is always relative, and this relativity includes the law of contrast, as well as relations like parent-child, up-down, north-south, and light-dark, along with an infinity of others. Hence, the leading associationist text of the 19th century emphasized both activity and relativity, two key tenets of radical behaviorism. Bain also emphasized the law of diffusion, such that all stimulation affects the activity of the whole body, much like the strings of a harp resonate to large vibrations occurring among them, around them. A loud noise has widespread effects. It alters our heart rate, perspiration, pupil constriction, and other indices of sympathetic nervous system arousal. While this doesn't make Bain an epistemological monist, it comes close. The law of effect referring to the influence of reinforcers and punishers is not essential to radical behaviorism. It derives from the conception of trial and error learning, which is popular during the 19th century. In 1859, in The Emotions and the Will, Bain noted that many actions seem spontaneous, since they occur in the absence of any clear outside stimulation. Consequences, he called them pleasures and pains, organize and direct such movements. He observed this in the behavior of newborn lambs, learning to suckle, and in human infants, removing needles that prick them. I get a huge kick out of that, imagining the human infants with needles pricking them. This primitive version of the law of effect bears little relation to modern views and became known as the Bain-Spencer principle after it was adopted by the English author Herbert Spencer. Bain may have been best known for his writings on changing habits using simple principles of association. William James described them in The Principles of Psychology in 1890, and they apply to changing the hour at which we arise, as well as to breaking that pesky opium habit. If you think that modern behavior therapy, which is the only psychotherapy that really works, is new, check William James' chapter titled Habit, which is chapter four, and you'll see that Bain had it all. Was Alexander Bain a radical behaviorist? No. But he stressed that activity is basic, stressed relativity, argued the whole body's involved in psychology, pointed to the importance of consequences, and promoted behavior modification. He was a 19th century associationist, but associationism is not always what you think it is. But the high road continues, perhaps surprisingly, with Wilhelm Wundt, who founded the first psychological laboratory at Leipzig in the 1880s, uh, 1879. Um, as myth has it, and he was not a radical behaviorist. 
But he was not an introspectionist, nor an associationist, nor a mediationist either. He was an epistemological monist in the line from Aristotle that culminates in radical behaviorism. Wundt defined psychology as a science of experience, and experience did not come inner or outer. The methods he used were surprisingly behavioral. And the, in the 1980s, Blumenthal tried to set the record straight for those who needed it. For instance, he clarified what Wundt meant by self-observation or Selbstbeobachtung. In essence, that was the scientific study of mental processes, as Wundt called it, perception, memory, emotion, by means of objective techniques, such as reaction time, measurements, counts of word associations, and so on. Uh, Wundt was often polemical when addressing the issue of introspection. In one article in 1882, he compared the introspectionist to the mythical Baron von Munchausen, a comic character of German folklore who rescues himself when he's stranded in quicksand by pulling himself up by his own hair. And Wundt viewed psychology as the study of activity or process, a key assumption of radical behaviorism. He wrote this in his 1892 lectures on human and animal psychology. And I'm only going to give you a couple of sentences of it. Substance is a surplus metaphysical notion for which psychology has no use. In other words, it has no use for things, for substance. Um, in all its phases, mental life is a process, an active rather than passive existence, a development rather than a fixed state. The understanding of the basic laws of this development is the primary goal of psychology. Edwin Boring understood Wundt and wrote, for Wundt, psychology isn't the science of inner experience because the distinction between inner and outer experience isn't valid. In the hands of introspective psychologists, such mental processes as sensations, images, and simple feelings were often treated as static bits of consciousness and thus given over to a false elementism for which Wundt is held responsible and against which the new movements have reacted. Wundt was misrepresented for almost a century before it became clear that he was not an introspectionist interested in analyzing conscious content. Sadly, the misrepresented Wundt was used as authority for many psychologists who did believe that introspective analysis was the wave of the future. Many psychologists still believe in the false Wundt and teach that falsehood to their students, scoundrels. Next, Charles Peirce in the unusual history of radical behaviorism. Charles Peirce was the founder of pragmatism. Well, and he well understood that reification was rampant long before Skinner argued against unfinished causal sequences and reification. Um, he describes a recent work by in an, on analytic mechanics, Peirce was a physicist, by Kirchhoff, where it stated that we understand precisely the effect of force, but what force itself is, we don't understand. Peirce says this is simply a self-contradiction. The idea which the word force excites in our mind has no other function than to affect our actions. And these actions can have no reference to force otherwise than through its effects. Consequently, if we know what the effects of force are, we are acquainted with every fact which is implied in saying that a force exists. In other words, saying that there is force independent of all of its effects and manifestations is to reify it, just like we reify intelligence. Here is someone who scores well on a certain kind of test and who does well in schoolwork and other things. And we give it a name, intelligence, and then we put it in a part of the brain and treat it as a little thing or a faculty. It's a terrible, primitive thing to do. Another point, anyone who studied Skinner's 1953 Science and Human Behavior should recall that he treated some, force of, some forms of thought as problem solving. For Skinner, a problem is a situation where a response is required, but we don't have one readily available. We do various things to induce a response that removes the problem, and that new situation act, acts as a reinforcer. This behavioral view of thought, treating thought as activity, is not new. Charles Peirce described it in 1878. Peirce said, we have there found that the action of thought, the action of thought, is excited by the irritation of doubt and ceases when belief is attained. So that the production of belief is the sole function of thought. In introducing his philosophy of pragmatism, Peirce defined belief, thought, and meaning in what was then a novel manner in terms of actions. Since a belief is a rule for action, the essence of a belief is the establishment of a habit. The whole function of thought is to produce habits of action. And whatever there is connected with a thought but irrelevant to its purpose 
is an accretion to it, but no part of it. For what a thing means is simply what habits it involves. So meaning is always tied to action. And what a thing is, whether it be a fuel injector, a hobby horse, or a BMW Z3, is always the sum of our actions with respect to it. That's a deep thought, dude, and it's also a monism of action. And that's radical behaviorism. Well, William James was a mentor, so to speak, of Charles Peirce, and William James' radical empiricism was a monism as he shifted toward a behavioral orientation after 1890. His positivistic view was opposed both to the associationism and the sole faculty theory that had defined psychology up to that point. Following his friend Peirce, he viewed mentality and cognition as behavior, as activity. As he wrote, the theory of evolution is beginning to do very good service by the reduction of all mentality to this type of reflex action. Cognition in this view is but a fleeting moment, a cross section at a certain point of what is in its totality a motor phenomenon. And we're all acquainted with a thing as soon as we have learned how to behave towards it or how to meet the behavior which we expect from it. Up to that point, it's still strange to us. James also believed that perception does not depend upon copies, as Skinner would argue later. Seeing an object not, not now present doesn't mean that an image must be present, any more than an image was present when we last saw the thing. I see this lectern, I'm not seeing an image, I'm seeing the lectern. Uh, as, as, he, as he put it, quoting actually Munsterberg, the object of which I think occupies its definite space in the outer world, as much as does the object which I directly see. And the interval of time doesn't transform an object known into a mental state. My home, which I do not see at this moment, is not now a mental state being seen by me. James also gave us a behavioral definition of reality. Radical behaviorists hold that what we call real depends on our history. This is similar to John Stuart Mill's theory of belief and Helmholtz's unconscious inference. And in all cases, reality is defined by our reactions. Whether it's a belief in God, <laughs> an Anthony Hopkins performance, the sun in the sky, or the BMW Z3. James defined reality in terms of reactions so that, number one, we believe in the reality of something that captures our attention and holds it. Number two, we believe in things that are lively and vivid, especially when they're connected with pleasures and pains. Number three, we believe in things that make us react, especially with instincts like fear or revulsion or curiosity, bodily reactions. Number four, in other words, real things produce emotional interest, whether it be love, dread, or happiness. And number five, real things are congruent with our expectations. So if you imagine something like, here is the very knife that Jack the Ripper used, or here is the very gun, or something like that, that grabs our attention, that's real. William James' most famous work, The Principles of Psychology, assumed that consciousness was an independent entity. But he changed his mind later. In his essays in Radical Empiricism, where he advocated a metaphysical and epistemological monism. He wrote this concerning consciousness. I believe that consciousness is the name of a non-entity and has no right to a place among first principles, a mere echo, a faint rumor left behind. For 20 years past, I've mistrust consciousness as an entity. For seven or eight years past, I've suggested its non-existence to my students. It seems to me the hour is ripe for it to be openly and universally discarded. As a final thought, it's interesting to note that James was very leery of professional groups that certify practitioners. In the 1890s, he testified on three occasions before the Massachusetts legislature, arguing against requiring certification of physicians. His opinions on this were strong, and arguments are easy to imagine. State or professional certification must frequently lend respectability and credence to charlatans and incompetence. Remember, the low student in that medical school class is still called doctor. State or professional certification, and in areas where knowledge is scant, such as medicine, certification examinations that are based on orthodox opinion are bound to exclude deserving but unorthodox applicants. At least that was the opinion of William James, himself a physician, as well as psychologist and a philosopher. James brought Hugo Munsterberg to Harvard from Germany 
take over the Harvard laboratories shortly after the turn of the century. He met, him at, he met Munsterberg at a Congress in Paris in 1889. Shortly thereafter, lured him to America. He sent the winning invitation through Edwin Delabar, a man of many talents, who worked with Edwin Thorndike in the 1890s, who worked with Skidder in the 1930s at Harvard. Munsterberg pioneered research and eyewitness testimony, work to be repeated by Elizabeth Loftus in modern times, as well as in industrial psychology and in advertising. He described this work with much more in a 1914 book, Psychology General and Applied. There he wrote that a person's thinking is as much a part of his actions as those, as those are a product of his thought. Seems to make no sense to me. There he wrote that a person's thinking is as much a part of his actions as those are a product of his thought. It makes sense now. As he said, an individual of a particular temperament and character and intelligence and talent does not stand in an independent outer world which shapes him, but the outer world which has a chance to influence him is itself the product of his tendencies to reaction. Personality and the world are in complete mutual relation. Another figure on this high road was James Rowland Angel, who was the teacher of John B. Watson, the founder of functionalism at Chicago, and like Wundt and James, Munsterberg and others, Angel argued against the assumption that ideas are things that we have, or are conscious of, that go away, and then return. As Munsterberg said, people who believe that their ideas in the bottom of our mind, that are retrieved, must wonder, mon, bleh, must wonder where their lap goes when they stand up. In 1906, James Angel put it this way. No matter how much we may talk of the preservation of psychical dispositions or how many metaphors we may summon to characterize the storage of ideas in memory, the obstinate fact remains that when we're not experiencing a sensation or an idea, it's strictly speaking non-existent. Well, getting closer to the present, we have the new realists. Uh, James wrote his pieces on radical empiricism during the last two decades of his life. These works led upon his death in 1910 to a movement at Harvard composed of philosophers interested in epistemology. They call themselves the New Realists and argued against the idealism of Oxford and of American universities. Following James, they rejected dualism, both metaphysical and epistemological. That is, they didn't believe in a distinction between mind and body, and they didn't believe in a distinction between subject and object. In these ways, they too followed Protagoras and Aristotle against Plato and his successors. One member of the group was Edwin B. Holt, an important thinker for many reasons, especially for his Aristotelian views. He also edited a book composed of chapters written by him and by his colleagues in 1912. It's called The New Realism. The quotes below give the flavor of his writing style. Holt's title, The Place for Illusory Perceptions in a Realistic World, is descriptive. His thesis is difficult to describe to a reader who doesn't accept radical empiricism, but it claims there is no illusory experience. There is also no distinction between mind and body or between knower and known. As Holt wrote, the line that separates the existent and the non-existent, or the false and the true, or good and evil, or the real and the unreal, seldom coincide and never significantly coincides with the line that distinguishes mental and non-mental, subject and object, knower and known. That's on page 373 of that book. This position is still held today by our last exemplar of the high road, Nicholas Thompson at Clark University, who wrote the following memorable passage, which I paraphrase. When I drink too much coffee, the behavior of people around me becomes irritating. But we must remember the Gelb disc. When the disc is illuminated by an unseen source, it appears luminous, but when the beam is interrupted, it can be seen to be illuminated. When someone points out to me how much coffee I've had, people around me are less irritating. The gelb disk is illuminated by an unseen source and appears to be generating light itself, to be luminous. Until we see the real light source, then the disk appears illuminated, not luminous. So too with our, quote, inner experience, which is neither inner nor outer. Thompson disputes the phenomenal reality of the inner-outer distinction. There is no mind in a body, and experience does not occur inside us. 
In this way, he's clearly in the spirit of the new realists and of their inspiration, William James. And that's the view of radical empiricism. In summary, radical behaviorism is very different from traditional psychology, and it represents the end of a thread that can be traced to ancient Greece. It tells us this. First, we're not machines with minds inside. The mind-body distinction is a foolish one that is foisted on us by folk psychology, and we need not accept it. Number two, our personal experience is important, and it is not inside us. Number three, we don't gain knowledge by making copies of the world. There's no mental world that's a version of the real physical world. Number four, we don't store memories either. The thinkers of the 19th century knew that. Number five, the brain is wonderful, but it's not equivalent to the mind. Number six, there is no self that endures through a lifetime. As our bodies and our experience change, so does our self. And number seven, love, despite the awful song that includes this as lyrics, is not an emotion. That is, many mental entities are actually activities spread over time. That applies to bravery, virtue, intelligence, and many others, including love. Thank you.